Hello again, welcome to the penultimate edition of our video history of Leicester City. This time we're going to cover the period between 1990 and 2010. The 1990s were a very eventful decade. It started with them just avoiding relegation to the third tier. It went on to have four Wembley playoff finals for a place in the Premier League, two promotions to the Premier League, three League Cup finals, two League Cup wins, two qualifications for Europe. The next decade, up until 2010, saw the club relegated from the Premier League, going into administration, promoted back to the Premier League, relegated again, relegated to League One, promoted from League One, and the decade finished with them in the Championship in the playoff semi-finals for a place back in the Premier League. The 1990-91 season was a near disaster for Leicester City as they almost got relegated to the third tier for the first time in their history. Fans looking at this fixture list at the beginning of the season would have been horrified to realise that apart from winning the first game, they would then lose their next seven league games, culminating in a 6-0 defeat at Middlesbrough. The sacking of David Pleat seemed pretty inevitable and he was sacked in January 91 and Terry Shipman resigned as chairman of the board. First team coach Gordon Lee became manager initially on a caretaker basis. Club captain Ali Mocklin became player coach. Martin George, pictured here, became chairman. It went down to the last game of the season. Leicester City depended on results from other teams and had to win as well. And they did beat Oxford 1-0 at Filbert Street. Tony James's goal, seen here, secured that victory. Results elsewhere went in Leicester's favour. And Leicester City did avoid dropping to the third division for the first time in their history. Following the near disaster of relegation to the third tier in 1991, the club appointed a new manager, Brian Little, from Darlington in the summer of 1991. He made five close season signings. They were Colin Gordon, Nicky Platanow, Paul Fitzpatrick, Kevin Poole and Ashley Ward. And they're all pictured here on the cover of the opening matches programme. Three Darlington defenders, Gary Coates with Jimmy Willis and Michael Trotter, joined the club soon afterwards. The season was relatively successful. They reached the playoff final for a place in the newly formed Premier League against Kenny Dalglish's Blackburn Rovers. By this time, Phil G, Ian Almondroyd, Simon Grayson and Mike Whitlow had joined the club. The playoff final ended in a 1-0 defeat to Blackburn Rovers. The penalty scored by the ex-Leicester City player... Mike Newell following a controversial incident in which David Speedy seemed to dive to win the penalty. The following season, 1992-93, saw Leicester City reach the playoff final at Wembley again. The season started with the club crest being replaced by this new running Fox logo illustrated here on a 1992 official supporters badge. Another departure that season was the reversion for the first time in 24 years to an all-blue strip. In October of that season, 18-year-old Julian Jochim made his debut. His pace in exciting forward play was an outstanding feature of the season, as this Crown Jewels t-shirt indicates. This picture was taken at the last home game of the season against Bristol City, by which time Leicester City were uh, assured of a place in the playoffs again. The following week, the 72-year-old main stand was demolished to make way for the new Carling stand as, the, as part of Filbert Street's development. The demolition of the main stand meant that the home leg of the playoff semi-final was played at Forest City Ground. It was against Portsmouth. Joe Chim's outstanding goal against Portsmouth in the playoff semi-final was crucial in ensuring that Leicester City secured a playoff Wembley final place. Leicester City's opponents for the second successive playoff final uh, were Glen Hoddle Swindon Town and this is one of the 40,000 tickets purchased by Leicester City fans for that game. This match day programme is a memento of a dramatic final which saw Leicester City recover from being 3-0 down, fight back to make it 3-all only to lose 4-3 by a late controversial penalty. The front page of the local Sporting Green supplement showed a totally disconsolate Steve Thompson and this summed up Leicester's despair at not quite pulling off what might have been a sensational Wembley victory. So for the second year running, a place in the Premier League was denied. The 1993-94 season ended in another playoff final 
at Wembley for a place in the Premier League and this time it was against Derby County and this time Leicester City finally made it into the Premier League. The season started with only three sides to fill the street as the new Carling stand seeing, being seen constructed here wasn't completed until later on in the season. In November 1993 Leicester City signed the Wales international centre forward Ewan Roberts from Huddersfield Town for a, three, for a fee of £300,000 and he became an important player for Leicester over the next few seasons. Leicester, as I said, did make it to Wembley for the playoff final. Nearly 40,000 fans made their way to the Twin Towers for the third year in succession and in front of a Wembley crowd of over 73,000, Steve Walsh, who had been injured for all of the season, or nearly all of the season, and had only just made a comeback, famously scored two goals uh, playing as a striker in a 2-1 victory over the favourites Derby County. So finally a place in the Premier League was secured. This picture from the club's archive is a famous, iconic picture of him celebrating his dramatic late winner. To commemorate their return to the top flight, the club produced this video, Leicester City promoted the official story of 1993-94 and this audio cassette, Yes We're Back, which contained Leicester City songs to celebrate their return to the Premier League. Soon afterwards there was a celebration on Victoria Park and here you can see the players uh, present at that celebration where several thousand fans were also present. Brian Little prepared for the first season in the Premier League by signing Mark Draper, a midfielder from Knott County, for £1.25 million, which was the first million pound signing ever made by Leicester City. The players proudly wore this Premier League shirt sleeve emblem for the first time in their opening match of the season, which was against Kevin Keegan's Newcastle United at Filbert Street, which the club lost 3-1. With the club struggling, in November, Brian Little suddenly resigned for personal reasons, only to be appointed as Aston Villa's manager four days later. Leicester City appointed Reading's Mark McGee to replace him, and is pictured here with Martin George, who had failed to entice Wickham Wanderers manager Martin O'Neill to Filbert Street. In January 1995, with Leicester bottom of the Premier League, Mark McGee spent a million pounds on Norwich City's striker Mark Robbins, who scored in his debut at a rain-soaked Manchester City to secure Leicester's only away victory that season. At the end of the season, Leicester City were relegated. In April, Leicester City also gave a testimonial match to World Cup winning goalkeeper Gordon Banks. This was against an international eleven at Filbert Street, 28 years after he'd left the club. This brochure contains tributes from Bobby Charlton, Franz Beckenbauer, Pele, Alan Ball, Gary Lineker and Peter Shilton. Mark McGee's objective was to get Leicester City back into the Premier League at the first time of asking. But in December 1995, he walked out on the club to become manager at Molyneux. His skillful Leicester City side was second in the table, despite his new signing Pontus Kamark, a Swedish World Cup semi-finalist, being injured soon after his arrival. This left a managerial vacancy, which was filled by Martin O'Neill in December 1995, who arrived instead of the hotly tipped Mike Walker, the ex-Everton manager. Martin is seen here with chairman Martin George on the cover of the programme of a postponed game against Ipswich on Boxing Day. The season then started to unravel a little bit. Despite signing players like Steve Claridge, Julian Watch, Neil Lennon and Muzzy Isit on loan, O'Neill only won three of his first 16 games which meant the side slipped to ninth place and this sequence culminated in a defeat, a home defeat against Sheffield United which prompted an anti O'Neill demonstration, an angry demonstration after the game. When all seemed lost, and with Emil Heskey, pictured here in this Mercury supplement, now in the team, Leicester then won six of their last eight games and sneaked into the playoffs with only 71 points. They then defeated Stoke City narrowly in the two legged playoff semi final, which took them for the fourth time in five seasons to Wembley 
Leicester fans purchasing tickets like this made their way to Wembley in the thousands for this playoff final for a place in the Premier League against Dave Bassett's Crystal Palace. This official programme provided pictures, features, statistics and player biographies for both sides. It even included an interview with Brian Little uh, about his three playoff finals for Leicester earlier in the decade. Leicester won this game in dramatic fashion and this picture captures one of the most dramatic moments in the club's history. A disbelieving Steve Claridge has just scored the winning goal four seconds from the end of extra time with Zelcho Kalach, the reserve goalkeeper having just arrived on the pitch to replace Gavin Poole for the anticipated penalty shootout. So there, here we have a triumphant Martin O'Neill holding the playoff trophy aloft shortly for the fans at Wembley and back in Leicester fans were once again out in force to welcome the team on their open top bus tour. The Premier League awaited and a really good era of, for the club was about to start. As part of his preparations for the coming season, Martin O'Neill signed Muzzy Is It from Chelsea for £650,000. Muzzy, as a lone player, had been a vital part of the side which had won promotion the previous season. Leicester City, though, were Bucky's favourites for relegation. This publicity shot of Steve Walsh and Simon Grayson modelling the new kit presaged a season in which Leicester did far better than expected as the club spent much of the season in mid-table and in fact finished ninth. They also won the League Cup that season, having defeated Premier League opponents Manchester United and Wimbledon on their way to the first League Cup final since 1965. Leicester City fans made their fifth trip in six years uh, to Wembley for the final against a Middlesbrough side captained by future Leicester City manager Nigel Pearson. Following a one-all draw against Middlesbrough at Wembley, Steve Claridge scored the winner in extra time in the replay at Hillsborough ten days later. The club's official newspaper, Goalpost, devoted a complete issue to this achievement. The following season, Leicester, because they were League Cup winners, qualified to play in the UEFA Cup, and in September they were drawn against Atletico Madrid. Despite losing 4-1 on aggregate, Leicester City acquitted themselves well. A referee didn't help. Uh, his performance at Filbert Street was so bad that he was dropped from the UEFA list. Atletico Madrid presented the club with his horse's head as a memento of their UEFA Cup tie against Leicester City. Despite the defeat against Atletico Madrid, Leicester City were third in the Premier League table at the end of September. As a result, Martin O'Neill was presented with the Carling Premiership Manager of the Month award, like this one, which is now in the club's collection. In October 1997, Leicester City became a PLC on the alternative investment market on the stock exchange. This press picture records the event. Initially, the club was valued at £36 million and shares were worth 110p. The value soon dropped, though, and the enterprise ended in disaster five years later, when the shares were actually worthless. In May 1998, by the end of the season, with the club finishing 10th in the Premier League, the decision was made to move to a new 40,000-seater stadium, at Bede Island South, which the site was on the other side of the canal from where King Power Stadium now is. In the 1998-99 season, with Leicester City now a PLC, a new boardroom reconstruction took place, which Martin O'Neill was less than happy with. In October 1998, thousands of these Don't Go Martin posters were held aloft during a home victory against Tottenham Hotspur in a successful attempt by the fans to persuade Martin O'Neill not to be tempted by Leeds United's determination to make him their new manager. In February 1999, Tony Cotty scored all three goals in Leicester's 3-2 aggregate victory over Sunderland in the two-legged League Cup semi-final. This secured City's second Wembley League Cup final in three years, this time against Tottenham Hotspur. At the Sunderland home leg, it was announced that the City Council had given planning permission for the new stadium at Bede Island. 
although this was never actually built. A pre-Wembley sensation prior to the League Cup final was Martin O'Neill dropping Frank Sinclair for the final for being late for a team talk. Spurs beat Leicester with a goal scored seconds from the end. Robbie Savage was involved in controversy when Spurs player Justin Edinburgh was sent off. In a season which saw Emil Heskey win his first England cap, Leicester City finished in 10th place in the Premier League. Steve Guppy, pictured here, was the only Premier League player in the country that season to play every minute of every match. The following season, 1999-2000, was Martin O'Neill's last at Leicester. This Daily Mirror article refers to the long-running boardroom split, which resulted in an extraordinary general meeting of shareholders at Donington Park, which resolved the boardroom split with the Gang of Four, so-called, who were opposed to those directors backed by Martin O'Neill, either resigning or being voted off the board. In January, following month, just days ahead of the public inquiry into the plans for the proposed new 40,000 seater at Bede Island, the new board pulled out of the project because they weren't satisfied with the developers' assurances over several issues. In February, in their third League Cup final in four years, Leicester City beat Championship side Tranmere Rovers 2-1. Both goals were scored by skipper Matt Elliott who also scored the only goal in a two-legged semi-final against Aston Villa the previous month. In June 2000, after days of agonising, Martin O'Neill finally left Leicester City to become manager of Glasgow Celtic and he took John Robertson and Steve Walsh, that is assistant manager and coach, with him. Two senior players, Steve Walsh and Tony Cotty, jointly applied for the manager's post, but despite Interest from people like Sam Allardyce, Joe Kinnear, Steve Bruce, David Moyes, Gillingham's Peter Taylor was appointed as O'Neill's replacement. In September, Leicester drew one all at Filbert Street in the UEFA Cup tie against Red Star Belgrade. They'd qualified as League Cup winners. In the return game, which Leicester lost 3-1, that had to be played in Vienna rather than in Belgrade due to the Yugoslavian War. This desk set uh, was one of the gifts to the club from Red Star Belgrade. In October the following month Leicester City went to the top of the Premier League um, having accrued 16 points from eight games. Uh, in December and January of that season with the club still riding high Neil Lennon finally left Leicester City to join Martin O'Neill at Celtic and Roberto Mancini the big Italian star made his Leicester City debut against Arsenal but he only made five appearances because he then left to manage uh, Fiorentina. In March, Leicester City were still riding high in the Premier League. They were in fourth place following a victory at Anfield. But then, despite this optimistic sporting blue front page on the day of Leicester's quarter-final against Wickham Wanderers, hoping for cup success, Leicester lost at home to third-tier Wickham Wanderers in the sixth round of the FA Cup. And following that, the season collapsed. This video tape records how Leicester City lost nine of their last ten Premier League games, eight of them back to back, and the club finished a very disappointing 13th. Leicester City's bad form continued into the new season, and by September 2001, they were bottom of the Premier League, and Peter Taylor was sacked. The new manager was Dave Bassett. Mickey Adams was appointed as his assistant, the idea being that he would take over as manager at an appropriate time. This actually had happened before the end of the season because Adams took over when Leicester's relegation from the Premier League was confirmed. The final game of the season was truly historic. It was the last ever game at Filbert Street, the club's home for 111 years. This souvenir programme marked the occasion and the final competitive goal ever to be scored at Filbert Street was scored by local player Matt Piper in a 2-1 victory over Tottenham Hotspur. The final curtain came down on Filbert Street a couple of days later with this Leicester City Legends game. 120 players were present. At the end of the game the floodlights were extinguished uh, to the strains of Old Lang Syne. That summer Gary Lineker officially opened the new stadium, pictured here alongside the old Filbert Street Stadium, just prior to Filbert Street's demolition. 
The first opportunity for fans to watch a game at the new stadium was a friendly against the Spanish side Atletico Bilbao and Jordan Stewart's late equaliser was the first goal ever to be scored at the Foxes' new home. In August 2002, there was the inaugural league match to be played at the new stadium. Leicester City beat Watford 2-0. Both goals were scored by Brian Dean and his boots from that game, seen here, are in the club's collection. Back in the Championship at their new stadium, Leicester City's attempts to get back into the Premier League started off well and from September onwards they were never out of the top two in the table. But financial problems were looming. In October, the club, with £50 million in debt, went into administration after a week of desperate moves trying to prevent it. 26 staff were made redundant. The club was offered for sale. There were three bids uh, to buy the club, including one from a consortium headed by Gary Lineker, which needed £5 million to achieve this purpose. They were supported by the newly established Foxes Trust and by Emil Heskey. In February 2003, with Leicester still going for promotion, Leicester came out of administration after the Lineker Consortium bought the club for £5 million. Also that month, fans voted overwhelmingly against an idea to revert to the old club's name of Leicester Foss. Uh, they showed their disagreement by holding up one of these cards C for City rather than an F for Foss card and the name Leicester City was maintained. In April 2003, promotion was finally secured following a 2-0 Easter Saturday victory over Brighton and Hove Albion. And here we see the players celebrating on the pitch after the game. They were promoted back at the end of the season in second place, 12 points ahead of third place Sheffield United. In future, teams who had been into administration were to be docked 10 points. Leicester celebrated this promotion by an open up top bus tour uh, through the city and they were back in the Premier League. But that return to the Premier League only lasted one season and at the end of the following season in May 2004 they played their last Premier League game for 10 years when they went to Highbury against unbeaten champions Arsenal, the Invincibles, and they were relegated. They lost that game and they were relegated along with Leeds United and Wolverhampton Wanderers. Despite that, home crowds for the season averaged about 31,000. The next few seasons were pretty grim ones for Leicester City, really. In October 2004, after a disappointing start to the championship season, Mickey Adams resigned and he was replaced on an interim basis by Dave Bassett, who was helped by Howard uh, Wilkinson. And then, that, and this was until the Hearts manager, Craig Levine, was appointed and Rob Kelly became his assistant. Financial pressures were still severe. In an attempt to alleviate these financial pressures, a plan was agreed for Leicester Tigers to take joint ownership of the Walker Stadium with the football club, but the deal fell through because the Rugby um, Football Union and the Football League couldn't agree on the issue of primacy of fixtures. 2005-2006 was also pretty grim. Despite a famous FA Vic, uh, Cup victory over the Spurs, Craig Levine, seen here saying goodbye to the players, was sacked and replaced by Rob Kelly. This followed a run of eight defeats and two draws, which put Leicester City in 22nd place in the Championship. With Rob Kelly at the helm, results improved to such an extent that Leicester did finish 16th, safe with four games to spare. Now, the highlight of this run was um, Joey Good Johnson's goal from the halfway line against Peter Taylor's Hull City. In 2006-2007, Leicester City passed for the first time in its long history into the ownership of one person. Milan Mandaric, the millionaire ex-chairman of Portsmouth, bought the club and here he can be seen being introduced to the crowd before a home game against Coventry in February 2007. The club continued to struggle and by the end of the season, Rob Kelly had been sacked by Mandaric and Nigel Worthington, as an interim manager, had taken over for the final five games of the season and Leicester very narrowly avoided relegation. 
The following year, though, 2007-2008, was the worst in the club's history. It started with the appointment of the colourful MK Dons manager Martin Allen. He signed a three-year contract. Mandrich described him as unquestionably the outstanding candidate, but after only four league games and a League Cup game, uh, he was he left the club by mutual consent. His replacement was Gary Megson. He lasted six weeks before he left to manage Bolton Wanderers, and then he, in turn. In November 2007 was replaced by Plymouth Argyle manager Ian Holloway. A large turnover of staff ensued, the team was rarely out of the bottom four, over 40 players were used in the first team that season, the club was a bit of a shambles and at the end of the season a home defeat against Sheffield Wednesday in front of a crowd of nearly 32,000 effectively sealed Leicester City's fate of dropping into League One for the first time in the club's history. A nil-nil draw at Stoke in the final match confirmed relegation and for the first time in the club's history, as I said, Leicester City were in the third tier of English football. The journey back from the disaster of being relegated to League One started in June 2008 with the appointment as manager of Nigel Pearson. He set about rebuilding the side by bringing in such players as Michael Morrison, Lloyd Dyer, Alexander Tunchev, Jack Hobbs and also by bringing Max Gradle back from Bournemouth where he'd been on loan. The side went to the top of the table in November and stayed there for the rest of the season following a run of 23 undefeated league games. They were strengthened during the season by loan signings of Mark Davis and Tom Cleverley and they finally clinched promotion at Southend United and here you can see the players celebrating that promotion, winning the League One title. The team was presented with the League One trophy after the final home game of the season against Scunthorpe United and a brighter future definitely beckoned. Preparing for the first season back in the Championship, Nigel Pearson signed Chris Wheel, Richie Wellens and then Martin Waghorn on loan to strengthen the squad. Paul Gallagher, pictured here, was signed in September as well. In November, with Leicester City second in the table, the club celebrated the 125th anniversary of its founding. And by May, by the end of the season, Leicester City had finished a creditable fifth, qualifying for the playoffs, which was good its first season back in the Championship. Cardiff City beat them 1-0 in the first leg in Leicester, but Leicester won the return leg in Cardiff 3-2 after extra time, but then lost in a penalty shootout uh, made infamous by Jan Kerbigan's bizarre penalty miss for Leicester City. But despite this disappointment, Leicester were definitely on the way back. Next time, we'll conclude the story. We'll see how Leicester City won the Championship title in 2014, the Premier League title in 2016, reached the Champions League in the quarterfinals in 2017 and have since then become an established force in the land. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.